Well, welcome to the 700 Club Canada. You know, today's show is uh, really the theme is take your worries to God. Any worries, Bill Markham? Do you ever worry? <laughs> I try not to. <laughs> is this confession? I don't know. I, I do. I do struggle sometimes with worry. Yeah. But I am learning to trust God in the process. Well, and I think it's a journey of a lifetime. Like we all have our worries in life, right? This is a difficult time, and we know that, especially leaders in this time, and many churches are having to make some difficult decisions. And recently in the news, we heard the story of Pastor James Coates in Edmonton, who was actually jailed for breaking health protocols uh, that were in place due to COVID. So you know, it's a tricky situation, and I'm sure we're, we want to pray for James and his family and those leaders out there. Absolutely, and I think it's really difficult for a lot of us to know exactly how do we respond to that because we might be on maybe differing sides of this opinion. But here's what I'm learning. I'm learning that all of us should honor our convictions. So if there's a conviction, honor that. And then to stay open in, in your posture. Like as these news stories come out and different people reacting in different ways, how can I listen and learn? And then finally, we should really applaud those who are truly living their conviction, whether we hold them or not. You know, I think that's a really good point, Bill. I think that often we can stand from a distance and hear a new story and forget these are real people. These are people in a church that had to make a choice for themselves or leaders. And, you know, we can be sort of shouting things from the couch rather than, I find it very important to be in the game myself. Like, I love that. Whatever God's called me, that's what I'm responsible for and show love and support for others, even though it might differ from my perspective. That is really good. And so on today's program, you are going to see how one former NFL player went from flat broke to helping to feed nearly 4,000 kids. And an incurable disorder leads one couple on a miraculous journey to finding faith and healing. This is how a former NFL player found faith and purpose off the field. I remember being able to go home and tell my parents, you know, I'm going to go to college on a football scholarship and it's not going to cost you guys a dime. All you have to do is come to the game and cheer. Signing day was wonderful. I went to Hemp University in 98. I would come back from practice, man, my senior year, and I would have maybe seven or eight messages from different agents. They want to represent me. April 22nd, 2002, watching the NFL draft. I answer my phone and it's Marvin Lewis on the line. And Marvin Lewis was a defensive coordinator for the Washington Redskins at that time. He said, Greg Scott, he said, are you ready to be a Redskin? I said, yes. I said, yeah, I, I am definitely ready to be a Redskin. To see that look on my mother's face that day, that look on her face, man, just to know, like, you know, the things that my baby told me he was going to do as a five, six-year-old kid. He's standing here as a 22-year-old man now, and he was focused, and he was determined enough to make it happen. So it was a good day. It was a real good day. I got to the NFL and I started enjoying some of the things that came with it. I got less focused on some of the things I needed to do to stay in the NFL. I found myself, I was spending a little bit less time in the field room, a little bit less time in the weight room. I was going into my second year. I got released from the risk and, you know, I went back to my home, just sat there quietly, maybe about two or three hours, just thinking about what was next. I felt lost. I look at my phone and I see this very different area code. It's Marvin Lewis on the phone again. And he asked me, you know, Greg Scott, are you ready to be a Cincinnati Bingo? I told him, yes, I'm ready. I had gotten refocused. I was putting the necessary time. I honestly felt like I was trying hard every day out there. Going into the 2006 season, you know, I made the roster. Then the second week of the season, that's when I got cut. You hand in your playbook, you pack up, come home. It was humbling, man. It was humbling because uh, being this NFL defensive lineman, you feel invincible. You've been throwing people around for four or five years, but now for that not to be a part of your DNA anymore, you won't be doing that every day anymore. It just kind of felt like, who are you now? You know, I just simply told people, hey, I got released. They decided to go in another direction. Now the next question comes, what are you going to do now? And at that time, I didn't know. And answering those questions at that time was just, man, it was heartbreaking for me because I didn't know what was going to be next pretty much uh, for about four or five months. So I stayed in a lot because I didn't want to have to deal with that type of stuff. But I had times, man, where I had $250,000, $260,000 in that account. Now I was at a point in my life where 
I'm struggling trying to keep $200 in my account. Can't make my truck payment anymore. I get a call from a foreign phone number on my phone. I'm getting my truck repo. So I drove out to a church right outside, uh, about five, 10 minutes away from my mom's apartment. That truck was the last thing I had from my NFL journey. I had gotten rid of all the jewelry, cars, houses, everything. I get out the truck, and I remember looking in my mom and looking in the car and seeing my mom's crying. And I had always seen mom cry about my achievements. So that bothered me. That, uh, mm. Seeing that truck drive away, I was riding back to the house. I was probably one of my lowest points I had been at because I had no money. I had uh, a daughter, you know. I had uh, just a lot of uh, empty thoughts and feelings. Felt like a has-been. I really started praying a lot more, and I started thinking, like, hey, man, why not go back to doing the things that you were doing every day before, you know? Taking the issues and problems that you have to God, asking him to help you with them. So I started doing that. And the more I did that, it seemed like the more doors were, were starting to open for me again. I started thinking, like, what can I do to talk to young kids that may have dreams, goals, ambitions of being something awesome, something no one else thinks they can do? What can I do to help them uh, keep them along that path, motivate them to stay attached to that dream? One thing led to another, and Cover 3 Foundation was birthed. It started out initially football camps. I started hearing about kids not being able to eat, you know? You know, kids are going home hungry from school, coming back to school the next day hungry. I implement C3 Kids Meals, and uh, that was uh, awesome. We started feeding three schools every day, Monday through Friday, and I had a young kid tell me that. Like, Mr. Scott, if it wasn't for your program, I would leave school and go home and would have to fend for myself. And I didn't know what I would eat until I got back to school the next day. And that's what motivated me, because I'm in a position where I can do something about this, and it would be a sin for me not to. That three schools went to 10. 10 went to 17. 17 went to 29. 29 schools went to 40. We now feed 4,000 kids every day in after-school programs. Going to bed every night knowing that 4,000 kids are being able to eat simply off a of vision, an idea that I had five years ago. It's a wonderful feeling. I think my faith is the main reason I'm doing what I'm doing now. Without the continually praying, the, the asking for guidance, I don't think I would have ever gotten to this point. Even when you think you're going through, you know, some of the most toughest trials and tribulations, God is always present. So have you ever been in a position where you felt what I call a burden? You saw something and it moved you and you thought, man, somebody should do something about it. And you're right, you should. I love how Greg Scott said it. He said, I was in a position to do something about it and to not do that was a sin. That sounds like really strong language, but James, the brother of Jesus, said it this way in James chapter 2, verses 15 and 17. He says, suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and be well fed, but does nothing about their physical need, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. And here's what I've learned. Faith is not just about believing the right things or saying the right things. It's actually about being motivated by the very nature and character of God. And what I love most about our Heavenly Father is that He is active. His passion motivates Him to action. And in the same way, faith should drive us to action as well. I just know in my marriage, you know, there are times when I can say, I love you, I love you, I love you all I want. But at some point, I gotta show it with my actions. I gotta back it up with demonstration of what I am saying. And so here's what I wanna encourage you today. 
open your heart. Open your heart to what God is saying specifically to you. And second, open your eyes. Look around and see the needs around you. And then finally, open your hands and move your feet. For this is what God has called you to do. And if you need prayer with anything, or maybe you'd like some support and something God is burdening on you, we'd love to help you with that. Why not call us at 1-855-759-0700, and we'd love to put this pamphlet in your hand called Guidance, how you can find God's power and purpose in your life. And now, here's your Springvale Minute. We've been using Robert Morgan's Red Sea Rules to guide us in our crisis. Red Sea Rule number six, when unsure, take the next logical step by faith. Exodus 14, verse 15, Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Don't just stay there. Take your next logical step. You know, in Scripture, we're constantly told, God gives us today what we need today. He doesn't give us what we need to tomorrow. Very rarely does he do that. He shows us what we need today. He says, don't worry about tomorrow. Focus on today. Pray for your daily bread. So the best thing to do is sit down with all the issues and fears and concerns and anxieties you have. Write them out. And then write what you could possibly do. What could you do today? Pray and then take the next logical step. Well, prayer is the next logical step, isn't it? 100%. <laughs> like, often it's our last resort. It should be our first resort. <laughs> yeah. Often, sometimes by the time we pray, it's almost too late. If we prayed yeah. a little bit earlier, we could have prevented Ex the situation exactly. that we're in. Exactly. <laughs> Why do we wait to pray? You know, Heather sent a request in, Bill, and said, please pray for reconciliation in my family. And I bet you there's a few other people watching that need that as well. Well, absolutely. And Anna Maria asked us to pray for her son, that he may accept help for his drug addiction and go into rehab and find God. And I think a lot of us are praying that people wouldn't only believe, but they'd act and find their freedom. Because freedom is not only believing, but it's actually acting uh, on these things. And so yeah. let's just pray yeah. specifically for these needs today. Well, I'm going to pray for Heather. Father, I bring Heather to you and her yes. family. And for all those watching that they say, yes, we need reconciliation in our family too. I pray that they would take the first step to forgiveness. Forgiveness towards those who have maybe hurt or offended them, forgiveness towards themselves, and that they would move into reconciliation. Whatever that looks like, Lord, I pray for healing in families in Jesus' name. Yes, and for Anna Maria today, I do pray. I feel her mother's heart, who's so heartbroken over maybe some of the choices and decisions that her children have made. And God, we, we know your heart breaks for us too when we find ourselves in a position that we were not created or designed for. So I pray that you would just give deliverance and freedom for all of those watching this right now who maybe find themselves in a place they know they're not supposed to be, in a struggle, in a battle that they know they cannot win without your help. My prayer is for freedom and deliverance to fill homes and hearts all across this nation, all those watching, and that with Anna Marie, we would pray for those in our life who we love desperately, that they would experience the life-transforming power that only you can give in Jesus. I pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. That's such a good prayer, Bill. And you know, I think turning to prayer first <laughs> helps us sort through a lot of the trouble around us, right? It's absolutely true. Yeah. And now, this is how a television show helps set the stage for a miracle. Sounds interesting. <laughs> I couldn't be perfect. I, I couldn't be perfect for my kids or my husband, and I just, yeah, I felt so much shame about that. It was pain keeping Nancy Johnson from being the wife and mom she wanted to be. At 24, just after giving birth to her first child, she developed fibromyalgia, a chronic incurable disorder that caused widespread pain and fatigue. The muscle pain never stopped, and so I was on this search, what am I gonna do? Nancy had a second child, but over the years developed more health issues, including severe allergies and thyroid problems. By the time she was 40, she was a shut-in, trying her best to take care of her family. The medical community had few answers, suggesting she try meditation and relaxation techniques to ease the suffering. One of the doctors sent me away with, it's all in your head, and that was just devastating. That was truly, it was, it was like hopeless. Okay, I'm just gonna have to go home and live with this. 
Over time, Nancy became allergic to more foods, severely limiting her diet. As she grew weaker, the responsibility of taking care of the kids, the home, and Nancy fell largely on her husband, Rich. So we're coming and going, and, and Nance is isolated in the house. That was hard. That was really hard. Adding to the daily pain and frustration, Nancy also battled depression and the voice constantly telling her she was a failure. I would worry in bed and think and things over and you're sick, you're, you'll never get well, you'll never make it, you're not good enough. Then at 49 years old, Nancy landed in the emergency room. She was unresponsive, had a temperature of 83 and weighed only 82 pounds. She was dying of malnutrition. I very nearly lost her. Her, her body had just depleted. She was literally hours away from uh, internal organs are going to shut down if we can't get her stabilized. It was, wow, that, I did some real. <sighs> Excuse me. It is some real soul searching that week. Soon, both of them would find what they were looking for. Within the week, Nancy was well enough to go home, but still needed constant care. Then a few weeks later, while watching TV, Rich came across a Christian channel. Pastor Joel Osteen was teaching about hope in Jesus Christ. I found that to be really uplifting. I really did. <clears throat> so I listened to one or two of them, and the family said, Nancy, you got to come listen to this guy. He's, he's got some pretty positive things to say. They had both gone to church as kids, but the Jesus and God they had heard about were distant and angry. I'm listening to him talk about Jesus wants to heal you. And I'm listening to that going, and my heart is just pounding like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, you know, oh my gosh, I've never known a Jesus like this. Like, this is a God who really wants to answer your prayers and heal you. Drawn by this message of hope, they tuned in for weeks. One day, Nancy prayed with Joel and asked God for his forgiveness and accepted Jesus Christ as her savior. I was astounded. I'm like, something huge just happened here. And I just felt this flood come in of, of like joy, like, oh my gosh. Then Nancy had a revelation. I was looking for an answer in every other religion, in every other avenue. I was trying to heal the soul. I just was going about it the totally wrong way. When Jesus came in, um, he, he loved me. He loved me back to life. He didn't care that I hadn't taken a look at the Bible. No matter what, he loved me. No matter how disabled I was, he loved me. Within a few weeks, Rich also gave his life to Christ. And it took me 50 long years to figure it out that I can't do it. I can't do it on my own. I tried, so I surrendered. I opened up my heart and invited the Lord in. And that's when the journey began. Now watching Christian television and attending church when Nancy was able, the couple started going to healing rooms to receive prayer for Nancy's health problems. And it was working. I could see breakthrough. I was able to drive myself. The allergies were breaking down. I was able to sleep. In time, every symptom had disappeared. The transformation was happening right before my eyes. I mean, I'm, I'm seeing a miracle happen. Nancy is grateful for the miracles in her life, but out of all of them... The miracle of salvation was really, you know, what I was after all along. Uh, all of this trying to find my health, trying to find the answers, it was just Jesus. It was, he's what I needed. He was the answer to it all. That's the real miracle, is the salvation. Because when he comes in, he saves it all. He's the savior of the health. He's the savior of the finances. He's the savior of the family. He's the savior of, he is, he is love. And in that love, everything becomes beautiful again. He's the savior of it all. I just love what Nancy shared. I, I find it so moving, this miracle in her life that didn't just heal her physically, but her whole person came to life. Nancy said the greatest miracle was her salvation. Isn't that the truth? Salvation in Jesus is the answer to everything. Salvation saves 
all of you. Jesus loves all of you. He wants your whole person to be healed physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. First, Thess First Thessalonians 5.23 says it this way, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, this is what salvation does. If you're watching today, I first of all, I find it so encouraging that it was through a TV show that Nancy and her husband came to know Jesus. So this is why I love to do what I get to do here, why we get to do this on 700 Club Canada proclaiming the truth that Jesus is the answer. He is the healer of everything, but it requires you to surrender your whole self to Jesus. See, it's a kingdom question. Whose kingdom do you belong to? God's kingdom or your own kingdom, which is actually doesn't exist. There's either God's kingdom or Satan's kingdom. If you welcome God's rule and reign in every part of your life, you can have a new day. This resource will lead you to understand the truth of why salvation in Jesus is the answer to everything. Call us at 1-855-759-0700 because we want you to experience the life and joy and the healing that only Jesus brings. We'll be right back with Bill and his Stepping Stones devotional segment. He founded a global ministry interviewed world leaders, was a leading presidential candidate, and he has walked with the living God. In Pat Robertson's latest book, discover the principles that guided this extraordinary life and how they can shape your future. When you become a 700 Club Canada partner, we'll send you your copy of I Have Walked with the Living God. Call now. I've come to realize that we are living in a cancel culture. Um, this is the ideology that states, if you don't agree with me, I will do everything in my power to drown out your voice and crush your idea by belittling and demeaning who you are and what you stand for. In essence, I will try to cancel you. And you know what? It is deeply personal and it is deeply painful. The consequence of this shame and blame approach to issues is that you're either forced to pick a side and fight anyone who doesn't believe what you believe, or shrink back in fear and never let anyone really know what you believe for fear of aggression and rejection. Unfortunately, it often emboldens the arrogant rants of the ignorant, and it steals the voice of the most vulnerable among us. So what are we, as followers of Jesus, supposed to do about it? Well, the Bible is clear that God's love is the answer. And I've discovered that when I ask, what is the most loving thing to do in any situation, I actually find peace, joy, and hope in the face of my dif difficulty. And maybe that's why Peter said in 1 Peter 4, 8, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Our ability to love everyone, even those with differing opinions in us, is what is supposed to make us different. It is what made Jesus so engaging, so powerful, so true. Jesus established this standard in the way he lived and in his words. In John 13, 35, he declared, By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. So, what do we do with issues that would try to divide us on opposing sides of an ideological battlefield? Especially when it is an issue that is causing conflict within the body of Christ. Well, first, Paul strongly encourages us to make unity our top priority. In Ephesians chapter four, he says, as a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There are no sides in the body of Christ. Instead, we stand together against the real enemy, the liar and the deceiver. We may not always agree on every issue, but we choose to serve one another anyway to bring the good news of the love of Jesus to a world that is war-torn by sin. We direct our fight to the lies that hold people captive rather than attacking those victimized by them. Second, we must learn to navigate our personal convictions. 
In 1 Corinthians 8, Paul says, we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know, but whoever loves God is known by God. For the sake of time, I have summarized what Paul taught in the, in the early church in regard in these two life statements. One, do not make a personal conviction a corporate expectation. And second, honor and protect the personal convictions of others. In other words, if there is no, not total agreement on a specific issue within the larger body of Christ, it probably means it's a matter of conscience. And there are many things that fall into this ca category, like who should vote, who we should vote for, getting the vaccine, yes or no, defying the government restrictions, to name just a few. And so our response as followers of Jesus should to be li to live within our convictions without compromising and to cheer on others who are living in their conviction without condemnation. I know what I'm asking is hard. I know that it feels like a compromise. But what I am asking is for us to reclaim the beauty and the power of what it means to be one in Christ, to let God's love once again be an anthem sung across our land for followers of Jesus to fight the liar and not each other. God's love is the only thing that is going to heal our land. And so I'm asking, will you join us in bringing the freedom of Jesus everywhere you go in a world that will try to cancel you let us be those who create spaces of belonging and open conversation so that we can all be who God has called us to be. And that is a stepping stone toward the life God has created you for. Wow, I just so appreciated uh, Bill's teaching us today. I think this was such a helpful thing for all of us because we're in a divisive culture and a culture that wants to separate people based on their point of view. And as believers, Bill really hit it home when he said our response as followers of Jesus should be to live in our conviction without condemning others. And that is actually, you know, you can live in freedom and have your point of view, and you can even fall, have confidence in God in that, but we're never to be condemning others because their viewpoint isn't the same as ours. And I just think that's a really healthy response and important, especially as the body of Christ. We're called to unity, we're called to love, and love is always the best response. So I don't know where you're at today and the divisiveness of our world and the opinions of others. Can I just say lovingly, listen to what the Heavenly Father has to say. His opinion matters. Read scripture. The voice of God matters. Lean into others who will help you keep your focus on your relationship with God, loving God and loving others. Keep it simple because that's the way Jesus lived and that's the way we can live. Hebrews 4, 16 says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Let's show that grace to others. That's the best way to show love. Thanks for watching. To contact us, visit 700club.ca.